good evening one and all present here good evening everyone i welcome you all to the uh, fourth talk the last talk of this year's dasra lecture series we have had three uh, talks in the last three days ranging on different topics like astronomy material science and uh, biological uh, creatures and all based on the same thing of size and scaling loss in nature and today is another talk by professor k n ganeshaya uh, we are all looking forward to this talk uh, before we go ahead i request our director dr bia guru prasad to welcome the gathering good afternoon to all of you and uh, as i told earlier also my presence is only customary here and uh, let me uh, limit it to less than a minute and you know the thing is dasra lecture series is one of the main components of the popularization program popularization of science program in jn uh, planetarium base and uh, the first lecture was uh, pertaining to astronomy second one was on biological systems day before yesterday yesterday it was pertaining to the uh, materials and today we have another beautiful talk that itself says about the beauty of nature as it says science behind the beauty of nature size scale and ratios in living systems by professor k n ganeshaya uh in uh, senior scientist department of genetics and plant breeding university of agricultural sciences gkvk campus uh though i had not met uh, professor ganesh earlier the common thing which binds us is both of us write in kannada and uh, maybe i write very little but anyway uh so he is as famous or perhaps more famous as a writer than probably as he is an academician i don't know whether i can take the liberty to say that but anyway uh, he is well known all over karnataka and respected all over karnataka and kannada speaking people for his writings and thank you sir for gracing the occasion uh, and agreeing to give a talk on this beautiful subject uh, on behalf of uh, jawarul nal nehru planetarium i profusely thank you for this and now i request sharanya to Uh, announce the next event a small introduction about the speaker professor k n ganeshaya obtained his bsc in agriculture in 1976 msc in genetics and plant breeding in 1979 and phd in 1983 from university of agricultural sciences bangalore He has served as professor in the University of Agriculture and Sciences since 1997 and as visiting professor in various national and international universities and he is currently the INSC senior scientist in the department of genetics and plant breeding at the UAS GKVK He established the School of Ecology and Conservation which is an interdisciplinary research unit of the UAS He has organized several national teams for mapping bio-rich areas of the country like the Western Ghats, Eastern Ghats, uh, East Himalaya region and Andaman Nicobar regions. Apart from being an academician, he is also a writer and has uh, authored several fictional thriller novels and short stories in Kannada. Some of his awards and recognitions include a Fulbright Fellowship, a Fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences, and fellow of the indian national science academy new delhi he is also awarded the parisara prashasti which is the karnataka state environment award from the department of forest ecology and environment and kannada sahitya academy datti award in 2008 for the kannada novel kanaka musuku he has been a very supportive resource person in our planetarium since many years and uh, everyone who has attended his lectures know about his depth of knowledge not only in his specialized field but in various other fields as well we are very lucky to have such a great speaker here today uh, speaking on science behind the beauty of living nature uh, thank you sir i request our director to hand over a memento from our side thank 
you, sir. The mom, you, can, you can all hear me? Memento is given, now I can walk out. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. So the stage is on. Yeah, Sharini, I might require your help on the board sometime. You will be here, no? Okay. So are we starting or waiting? Starting. Okay. First of all, let me thank the planetarium and the director and uh, Sharini and Madhusudan for inviting me here. Uh, I would like to now start with a small memory test. Now what I would appreciate is all of you close your eyes. Don't open your eyes till I tell you to open and think of a flower, any flower. Close your eyes and think of a flower, just one flower. Now don't open your eyes. Let me see, don't open your eyes. Let me see how many of you thought of sunflower, raise your hands. Okay. Put, no, don't open your eyes. Put your hand back. And uh, how many have you thought of rose? Raise your hands. Yes, thank you. And also think of the flower that you have thought about. How many petals are there in that flower? Just think about. You got it? Now you can open your eyes. Now I found that as expected, most of you have thought of a rose flower and some of you have thought of a sunflower. We will perhaps now see the reason why you thought of rose and sunflower later. But let me now start with what I asked you to now think of. Now I asked you to think of how many petals are there in a the flower, correct? Okay. Now how many petals are there? Let me see, how many of you had Part of a flower which had only one petal, raise your hands. Only one petal, no hands up. How many of you thought of a flower which had two petals, raise your hands. No two petals. How many of you thought of a flower which has three petals, raise your hands. One. How many of you thought of having four petals, raise your hands. Okay, some three, four. Five petals, very good. So as many, six petals only one. Seven petals, one. Eight petals, I think we'll stop here. So as you could see here, most of the people seem to now have thought of a flower which has either three or five petals, very rarely seven or other petals, okay? Now let us see if whether what you thought is really true or not by taking some examples, shall we? Now what is the number of petals in here? Five and then, and then, yes, five. then, eight, three, five, 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 two, four. Okay, there is a problem here. You can see here, three, eight, five, and five. You all saw the sample. So, what kind of flowers are more? Flowers with three petals or one petal or two petal or four petal or five petal, which is more abundant? Five. Yes? Five. five is more abundant. In fact, I made a list here. How many flowers were there with the two petals, three petals, four, five? As you can see, there are more number of flowers with five petals. But is that all? Let us now take some more. Again, another flower. How many? How many? How many? And then there are 13 petals in that, okay? And then there are 8 in this, there are 13 in this, and how many are there in that? One. Only one. In other words, if you now see the list that we have already, sorry, the list that we have already made is almost correct, except that we are adding some 13 petals and 8 petals also frequently. In other words, the most frequent flowers are the flowers with the most frequent number of petals seems to be 3, 5 and 8 and then 13 and 20. You all agree with me? Okay. And of course 1 and 21. In other words, if you now look at the number of flowers in a petal, we have either uh, 5 or 1 or 2 or 3 or 3, uh, how many are there? Sorry, 8 or 3 or some 
numbers like that. It appears flowers with some number of petals are missing. You would agree? What are the ones that are missing? Four is very rare. There was only one and there was a problem with that. Six, did you see any flowers with six petals? Seven, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. These are all the numbers that are missing in the flowers of the petals that we see all around. You all agree with me? Surprisingly, plants seem to love some numbers. They seem to now have certain numbers more frequently as petals and they seem to love certain numbers. Which are these numbers? Can you recollect? Yes, someone told that. Wow, wow, wow. I don't need to give the talk. Maybe you can come here, Meda. <laughs> you can see that we have flowers with only 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13 and 21. May I know your name, Madam? Veena knows Fibonacci numbers. Flowers don't know Fibonacci numbers, but nevertheless they follow it. Isn't that surprising? She is a mathematician perhaps or a very great reader, uh, very good reader. And so she knows about the Fibonacci number. You can see here, what you see here is actually a Fibonacci number and a Fibonacci. I'll come to that for those who don't know about this. So we see that plants seem to have a special love for some numbers and those numbers seem to be 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13 and 21. What is special with these numbers, I'll come to a little later. But if you want to now test this, go to any literature and look for the number of petals of different flowers. You see that always it is 3 or 5 or 8 or 13, 21, 34, 55, 89. And those who know about the Fibonacci would have already found out that plants seem to love Fibonacci numbers. Plants seem to now somehow better have a better knowledge of the Fibonacci series than any of us perhaps. Now why is that? We'll come to. In other words, if you take this number of petals in the flowers of 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, there is something very peculiar with this. What is that? You add the first and second number, 1 and 2. What is the total? That is the next number. You add 3 to the previous number. What is the total? 5, add to the previous number, you get 8, add the previous number, you get 13. So if you go on adding the previous number in that series, you always will get the next number and that is a speciality of Fibonacci. However, for the Fibonacci series, you just have to add one more in the beginning because that becomes a constant starting point, okay. So take one and repeat that, 1 plus 2, 3, 2 plus 3, 5, 3 plus 5, 8 plus, it goes on and on and on and that is the Fibonacci series. Surprisingly, plants seem to now follow this particular series in having, in producing the petals and not any other number. Note that there are some numbers missing here. 4 is missing, 6 and 7 is missing, 9, 10, 11, sorry, sorry. And there 9, 10, 11, 12 are missing, 14, 15 are missing and they are all not seen in the plants. Whereas we frequently see these numbers. Isn't that interesting? Anyone? Can tell me why it is so perhaps before we go ahead? Why could that be? If you are interested to know as to why it is, you have to sit through my talk, will you? Okay, let us see. Now incidentally, as I told, this is called Fibonacci series and this was proposed by this man called Fibonacci. It's, this name of Fibonacci is a uh, alias name for him. His actual name is Leonardo Pisa. He is from the city of Pisa in Italy and he wrote in Tolnato a book called Book of Calculus in, it, in Italy or Italics or sorry Italian language it is called book what is that Liber Abbasi or book of the Calculus and in this he mentioned this series and so this whole series is called after him called Fibonacci series. How many of you had heard about the Fibonacci series before this? Very good. So all of you know. Then why didn't you identify before uh, Veena, madam? Madam, your name? Veena. Why didn't you all tell about Fibonacci series before Veena told? Pardon me? Oh, oh, oh. That is, that is being too mathematical. <laughs> but the series is Fibonacci, right? Anyway. So he is the one who proposed this series. But is he the one who proposed this? Any alternate names? Very good. Yeah? No. An Indian. Okay? He is Leonardo Pisa. But before him, he proposed in Tolna too. But before him, Acharya Pingala, as early as 
450 to 200 BC has proposed this Fibonacci series much, much differently than Fibonacci. This is actually in a book called Chanda Shastra, a trade as a Fosodi, and uh, he called it as Matru Meru. I will tell you what is Matru Meru. I will not perhaps now go into the details of Pingala and Fibonacci because that is not important here, but just to give you a taste of how we developed Fibonacci series. Incidentally, this Pingala is supposed to have died by having bitten by a crocodile. That is mentioned somewhere in the thing. Now, let me now go into the details or uh, rather the Sanskrit shlokas of uh, Pingala. That is the Sanskrit shloka. I will not take the trouble of reading it. That is the meaning. The meaning of that is simply the following. What is that? Construct a square and below that construct two squares which overlap with the previous. Below that construct three squares which overlap with the previous. Below that you construct four squares which overlap with the previous three. Go on doing like that. That is step number one. You are all with me? Step number one. Step number two he told in that particular series of I mean, squares put 1, 1, 1, 1 at the extreme edge of this whole uh, triangle. Are you all with me? Okay, just 1, 1, 1. And now when you put that 1, 1, 1, you see that there are some blanks there. Now to fill up the blanks, add up the ones, that is the cells that are above that. So what will be here? 1 plus 1 is 2. And what will be here? There will be 2 here, remember. 2 plus 1 is 3. And 2 plus 1 is 3. And that is his third step. Fill up the cells that are blank with the sum of the totals of the cells on the top of it. Are you all with me? Okay. So you now get this series, 5, 1, 5, 6, 5, 1. Now if you now carefully look at that particular triangle and draw a diagonal line along that line, you see that 1, 2, 3, 5, it goes on and that gives you the Fibonacci series. Are you all with me? So, Pingala developed the Fibonacci series almost 1000 years before Fibonacci and so we should call this series as Pingala series or Fibonacci series? Yes? Pingala series, isn't it? It is also called as Matru Meras, Matru Meru series. So, here afterwards, if at all, all those who raised your hands, how many of you knew about Fibonacci series, raise your hands? Please try to now refer to this as Pingala series. Not because we want to be over nationalistic, to give the credit to the right person who actually developed the theory, isn't it? We, why should we now unnecessarily attribute to a wrong person? Incidentally, of recently there is some history that is showing that Fibonacci in fact had known about Pingala's writings. So no wonder if he has actually developed this by copying it from Pingala. And so perhaps this Fibonacci series is better called as Pingala series, okay. So that is the Fibonacci series and that Fibonacci series is 1, 2, 3, 5, 8. So if you now go by Pingala series, you don't need to have one in the beginning. Are you with me? Okay. <clears throat> so where is this Pingala series seen? So I'll be referring it to as Pingala series. Where is this seen? If you have, I know some people imagine sunflower when I ask you to Im imagine the flower. In the sunflower, you see the seeds that are arranged are arranged in such a fashion that if you now look at from a distance, there are two opposing kind of arcs that you find. One arc turning to the left, another turning on the clockwise direction. Can you see that? You can perceive those arcs. Can you? In the sun, sorry, in the sunflower here. One going this way and another going that way. If you carefully count the number of those circles that are projecting out either left or to the right, the numbers of them correspond to the Pingala series. For instance, in this, I think it is written there 34 and 21. 21 circles to one side and 34 circles to the other side. It is also seen by biologists that if there is a tree growing and if it is branching at different places and if you cut that at exact intervals and count the number of branches, that also follows the Pingala series. 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13. In other words, in nature, this Pingala series seems to be repeatedly being found, not only in petals, but also in the way the seeds are arranged, also in the way the branching pattern is seen in the plants, in so many different ways. 
So in addition to that, there is something very peculiar with the Fibonacci series. That is, it gives a convergent ratio. What is that? Let us say we divide this value by the previous value. What is 1 by 1? And next value 2, divide that by 1. What is the ratio? 2. 2 by 1, okay. And then 3 by 2, 1.5. And if you do that, you see that the ratio starts fluctuating in the beginning, in the beginning, but gradually it settles around a peculiar value called 1.618 or 1.62. This is called the golden ratio of nature. You now go on doing it till infinity, that ratio will settle around 1.618. Are you all with me? And this ratio is called as the golden ratio. Now, why it is called golden ratio? Because people have found that this golden ratio seems to be now repeating almost everywhere in nature. One of the best examples I can give you is from our own whole hand. I will come to that little later. Now, what is, how do we define this ratio of 1.618? Let us say we take, I pass on some uh, cardboards. You all went through that. Now, let me see. You all were asked to now see those cardboards and see which among them appeal to you the most. You all saw that? Now, let me see. How many of you liked A? Okay. How many of you like it B? How many of you like it C? Okay. How many of you like it D? Okay. There were E also. Anyone who liked E? Okay. As you can see, B and C are liked by more, but actually there is an experiment that has been done world over. What is the experiment? The same kind of design was taken all over the world. Or several people were contacted and they were asked to now rank which is the one that is more appealing to you. It turned out that the cardboard that is C was found to be the most appealing one and what is speciality with that cardboard 3 is the following. This has, if this is length is 1 and this is 1.6 times. So, any, any shape which is 1.6 times or 1.62 times more than the width is the one that apparently seems to be very much appealing to the eyes of the human beings. Now, why is that? That is probably because in the entire nature, without our knowledge, you will be seeing this ratio very, very frequently. Now, I was actually planning to now grade or rank these grids here on the table in case if Madhusudan and Sharanya I have not prepared the cardboards and that is the reason I brought and I could have done the same thing. Eventually it turns out that this C which is actually 1.612 or 1.6 is the one that is generally appealing to most of the people in the, in the uh, world. Now what is the speciality of this golden ratio? Let us take our hand. Now if you take your palm and if you measure the length of the bone in the index finger from here to here and length of the bone next to that and take the ratio of long to the short, you will get 1.612. Don't do it now, we can go back and do it. Okay? Are you with me? Take the length of the bone here and the length of the bone here, divide the long by the short, you get 1.61. Take the length of the second one and the next one, take the long to short, you get 1.61. Take that and the last one and divide again long by short, you get 1.62. Are you all with me? The question is, why? what is the advantage of having this 1.62? Why should we have this kind of 1.62 ratio of decreasing size of the bones in our hand? The reason is, there is a beautiful curve you get by this 1.62 ratio. Now, this is the golden square or golden rectangle. The, what is the speciality of golden rectangle? If you now take the width as 1, the length will be 1.612 times. Are you all with me? So that is the golden rectangle. Now let us take away from this golden rectangle the square equivalent to the width of that rectangle. That is that one. Are you all with me? So I am taking out the square from the golden uh, rectangle. This is gone. 
and then you see that you get a piece which is again having a golden ratio. The length here will be now 1.612 times the width. Take out the square from that and you end up another square which is again a golden ratio. Go on doing that, go on doing that, you will now get a shape which if you can connect with let us say the curves of this kind, you get a spiral, perfect spiral curve. Are you all with me? That is the perfect spiral curve. Now why should the spiral curve be very important? That is important because in your hand, the bones that are having the golden ratio can give per perfect folding and the perfect grip can be obtained because of this 1.612 ratio. Are you all with me? You can now in fact see that if any of the length is longer, you can't hold yourself anything with such a I mean, perfect grip. You can fold like a spiral and that spiral is found not just in our hand, look at the tail of a lizard or a chameleon, also now follows the same kind of curve and that curve can be obtained only if the bones are actually placed at 1.612. Any of you who are interested in more in that, you can go and Google, you will see there is an artist who has developed this. He has connected this golden ratio cards and has connected them with the thread and if you now just throw it out, it unopens like a tail of a monkey or of a chameleon and if you draw the thread, it folds back like our hand, perfectly gripping to the closeness. Are you all with me? In other words, the importance of 1.612 ratio is that it actually gives you a good curve that actually holds or folds like a spiral and that can give you a good grip in your hand or in the tail. It does not stop there. Many of the designs in nature are actually spirals like that. Even the flowers that actually start unfolding in the very bud, they are actually in the spiral shape like that. Okay? It is not only in the living systems, even in the physical systems, this is a storm and that of course is a snail and this is a galaxy. In all these situations, you see that this golden ratio starts appearing again and again and thus without our knowledge, we have been now trained to now appreciate the golden ratio and golden ratio is the result of the Fibonacci series and so we have all been trained to now appreciate the Fibonacci series or this kind of ratio is of the cardboards. Are you all with me? Okay. I do not want to now delve into this, but there are some artists who believe that even the shape and size and the placement of the eyes and nose and all that are all fitting to this kind of uh, golden ratios. I will not like to spend time on that. If any of you are interested, you can go back and perhaps now try it out. In fact, they also say you will have a most beautiful face if it fits to the golden ratio. You want to test it? Go and test with your mother or with your sisters. But this Fibonacci series and golden ratio do not stop just there. They now seem to be appearing in many other situations and it is so frequent that obviously one would be prompted to ask the question, why this Fibonacci series? Why this golden ratio? As a matter of fact, to the young boys here, let me tell you, even to date, how it is attained and why it is so is not completely answered. Though I did give some examples of the fist and the spiral and all that, there is much more to now discover here mathematically and biologically. However, there are some situations we can now or some examples we can now put across and say perhaps it is because of this. One among them is what is called as philotaxy. How many of you know about philotaxy? Very good, very good. Not many. Philotaxy is nothing but the arrangement of leaves around a stem or around the branch. Okay? Now, what do I mean by arrangement of leaves around the stem and branch? Now, look at this diagram here. There is a leaf here. You can see the leaf. If you now track along the stem, to another leaf which is placed exactly above that. Are you all with me? If you trace a leaf which is placed exactly above that, that is the leaf that is overlapping with that along the stem 
and count how many nodes are there from the basic to that particular, that is value number one. And then start circling around all other leaves till you reach that leaf which actually is overlapping with the basal leaf. And if you count the number of circles, the number of circles comma the number of nodes will be a Fibonacci series. Now I'm going to pass on this. You can in fact track, track that. Now take any leaf and look for a leaf that is exactly placed above that and start circling around the number of circles that you know required to now reach that leaf. The number of circles comma the number of nodes above that will be Fibonacci. In this particular, it is 5 comma 8 Fibonacci series. You can go to the field and count. One other warning. Many of the things that I'm now telling here may not always be found in every part of the biological system because biological systems are bound to be sometimes problematic. Nevertheless, in most of the situations, you are likely to find it. I'll pass on these leaves. You can go back and see in many other situations, it will either be 1 comma 1, 2 comma 3, 3 comma 5, 5 comma 8, 8 comma 13 is very difficult to find because, now why is that? This is because when you now have the same leaf overlapping on the earlier leaf, the solar radiation will not be able to reach the bottom. So what is the way? You separate out that leaf in such a way that you have a lot of space in between. Are you all with me? Okay. So in other words, the arrangement of the leaves is so perfectly now placed by this Fibonacci series that you have all the leaves exposed to the solar radiation. And if you compress this pillow taxi, like as if you are pressing to one point, you will see that the spiral will be arriving at the spiral that you saw. So Fibonacci series, in other words, gives you the spiral when you compress the filo taxi from top to the bottom. Are you all with me? So Fibonacci series, spiral and golden ratios are all linked because of this natural situation. Again, a sunflower. Now, why are the sunflower showing Fibonacci series? As I told, the answers to this question are not completely available. There are only indications. One among the indications is that there is a most perfect way or strategy to pack the seeds in a sunflower. That is one among the answers. Let us now examine. Let us say that is a seed. And let us now put the next seed exactly 90 degrees to that. So this is pointing to the north. 90 degrees means it should point to the east. Correct? Now let us put one more seed 90 degrees to that, to the south. One more seed 90 degrees to that, which is west. Okay? So in the first row, how many seeds can be put? Four seeds. Okay? Now if you start the second row, you see that the seeds cannot be placed perfectly. Isn't it? It now starts. Not only that, look at here. So much of space is wasted now. Now let us slightly change the angle. What is the angle we are placing the seeds? 90 degrees. Right? Let us slightly change the angle. Now, what I will do is, I will not put exactly 90 degrees, I will put it less than that, exactly overlapping with that. We can do that. So, go on doing that, you will see that the very first row is now having 5 seats. The same space, in the previous, in the previous strategy of packing, you had only 4 seats. Now, how many are there? 5 seats. So, the better way of packing by changing the angle. But this also is not correct and not good. Why? Now start doing that again for the second row. You will see again you end up in a lot of space wasted. So you see that by changing the angles we can increase the efficiency. What is the best way of now packing? People have found that the best way of packing is 137.5 degrees. And that is exactly what you now find in sunflower. The angle of deviation of the next lead to the next seed to the previous seed is 137.5. Now, what is this 137.5 to do with Fibonacci? Anyone? 137.5 is also called as the golden mean angle. And how does the golden mean angle come about? Golden mean angle come about by this formula. What is that? Golden mean angle is equal to 360 degrees which is the total number of degrees in a circle, minus 360 into reciprocal of the golden ratio. If you take the golden ratio reciprocal and multiply by 360 and, do, and 
Take it out from 360, you get 137.5. Take the example. Remember, 89 comma 144 was the golden ratio sequence. You all remember that? Now divide 144 by 89, it is 1.619, that is a golden ratio. Now take the reciprocal of that. Reciprocal of that is 1 by 1.619, the ratio is 0.618. Multiply 0.658 into 360 and reduce that from 360, you get 137.48. Are you all with me? In other words, you see that the Fibonacci series, golden ratio, golden mean angle, they are all somehow tied together to create the nature around us. And we are all trying to now appreciate that golden angle, golden ratio, golden mean, and thus, is the reason why we also perhaps like the golden ratio rectangles, okay? <clears throat> now let me shift, uh, how much time I have, Amma? Means I have, okay. Now let me start with an another, so far we spoke about Fibonacci numbers and Fibonacci values and the scales and ratios. Let me start with what is the beauty of our body are from this side, volunteer. If you don't come, I'll pull you. Very good, please come. Sharanya, maybe you can join in. We will do some small measurements to see how our body is actually having some perfect ratios or relations. Now, you please come. I want you to measure his height from here to the base and cut the, you can help him. Need little cold. Okay, now here is the scissor, cut it. Be careful, you should not be too much. It is, yeah, here, here, here. Here, here, here. Okay, okay, hold this. Now, Sharanya, can you do the same thing to him? Go and help her. Hold this. Come. Hold this. Okay, wait. You can take another one. Yeah. Measure is yeah, maybe that better. Yeah. Yeah. Take this. Yeah. To the ground, to the ground. To the ground, ground. Yeah. Cut it. Yes, okay. Now come here. Your height we measured, no? You have that thread, okay. Stand here. Now we have measured his height, you all saw that? Now we'll ask him to stretch his hands. Now, Sharanya will hold this thread from here, horizontally. From here, here. You saw that? His height is exactly equal to the spread of his arms. Nothing very strange about it, isn't it? Nothing very strange. But, yeah. Let us test with them, him also. Hold this. It fitted. So the ratio of your height to your arm spread is 1. It's exactly equal to your height. So next time when you want to now measure, you don't need to now measure putting the scale onto the wall, you can actually measure this. No, no, one minute, one minute, it's still there, okay? It doesn't stop there. Now, take that thread, take this thread, his thread, where is this thread? You take that, fold once, fold once, okay? And fold once more, so it is one-fourth, correct? Yeah. Yeah, make it one-fourth, yes? You will see it exactly comes from here to here, or from here to the knees, or from here to here, 
are from here to here. In other words, one fourth of this is the height from ground to your knees, knees to your waist, waist to chest, and chest to you can measure it also. Okay, very bottom, come to the knees. Yeah, yeah. You all agree with that? So, in other words, our bodies seem to be now fitting to some specific scales. One fourth of our height is up till here, one fourth of our height is up to knees, one fourth of our height is knees to the waist, and one fourth of our height is waist to the chest. Just doesn't stop there. Make this one sixth. One sixth, can you? How do you do? Alternatively, I will tell the result what it is. You, you now take the height from here to here, this will be one sixth of your height. You can actually now make it six times, it actually meets that. Okay? Are you all with me? But, yeah, you saw that? Yeah, thank you. <coughs> Go and say it. But, this is only a very simple thing that everyone perhaps knows about it. There are, there is something much more and I would say much more surprising about our body. What is surprising? Let me tell you. This is the diagram of a human body written by one of the famous artists. Obviously, these artists follow all these ratios. Not only these ratios, let me for a moment give you an another diagram. Does the diagram look like a good human being? Yeah? No. Yeah, yeah, isn't it? Doesn't look like. And let me give another. Does it look like a good human being? No. In the first one, the length of the body from waist down is elongated. And in the second one, the body from head to the waist is elongated. How about, in other words, they look like alien as some of you saw, isn't it? So we don't like these bodies and we don't like aliens also, unless he really comes now because we'll be surprised about uh, and we're happy about talking to him. But the most perfect body is that, we are like that. Because that fellow corresponds to all these ratios or all these scales that we just saw. Length is equal to span and one fourth of our height is equal to height from knees to ground, etc, etc. Not only that, the most beautiful body is supposed to follow some ratios we already saw, that is the arm length is equal to the height, that is 1 is to 1. And we also saw that some of these measurements are 1 is to 4. And we also saw that our head height into 6 times, if you put, is equal to our height. But there is also a golden ratio in our body. The golden ratio can be defined as follows. Let us say, I take some length which is defined as a red color or what is this color? Red color, huh? orange, orange color and another ratio uh, in green color and they are 1 is to 1.6. Now, where do you find the golden ratios? If you now measure our height from head to the navel and navel to the ground, the navel to the ground is 1.62 times the height from our head to the navel. Artists actually follow this knowingly or unknowingly and that is why some of the most beautiful artistic constructions look so good. Not only that, the length from our neck to the navel and if you measure the length from navel to the knee, it is 1 is to 1.62. If you measure the length from ground to our knee and knee to the navel, it is 1 is to 1.62. So without our knowledge, it somehow sees, we find that golden ratio seems to be now all pervading in our body construction. Not only in our body, entomologists, people who study insects have found that this is 1.62 times, sorry, 1.62 times the next uh, appendage and that is 1.62 times next appendage, etc, etc. There is golden ratio within insect. Those who know DNA might know that the width of the DNA is 34 uh, 21 angstroms and the length of one circle is 34 angstroms. 21 comma 34 is 21 comma 34. Remember the Fibonacci series. Okay? In the Fibonacci series, 21, 34 also comes as the subsequent numbers. And this is not only in this spiral, you know, there are a number of situations where all this start appearing and I will perhaps not go into the details of that.
now. Let me jump the gear for a slightly different thing and then bring about something that is related to our body size and our physiology and our mental perception. You all know that organisms range in their size from as small as few grams to as high as several hundreds of or thousands of kgs. For example, mouse is about 100 grams, a rabbit is about a kg to 3 kg, a chimpanzee is about 50 kgs, and cow is around 800 kgs, elephant is about 4000 kgs. How many of you attended the talk the second day? So I think Vijay Kumar must have told about the body size relation and metabolic rate, did you? Okay, otherwise also we'll perhaps now go through that. Now the question I want to now pose here is the following. What does rabbit eat? Yeah, very good. Suppose I give two alternatives, grass versus bamboo. What does the rabbit eat, bamboo or grass? Grass, very good. So bamboo, sorry, rabbits eat? Whereas elephants eat, why is that? Why can't elephant eat grass and rabbits bamboo? Pardon? Or let us take another thing. Chimpanzees and gorillas eat leaves. Whereas cow eat, not just grass, you know, crops like ragi, jowar, etc. Isn't it? In other words, you see that there are some diets that organisms have evolved to. An elephant cannot live by eating grass and a rabbit cannot eat bamboo. Correct? A rabbit cannot eat bamboo. Why is that? This is related to some of the allometric ratios of the physiology of, our, of these bodies. Let me now first of all go to that. Now this is an historical diagram where Antony Levasseur measured the amount of oxygen we consume or amount of air we consume which actually is related to the oxygen and these interesting things about this particular diagram or the what I would say the art is that one who is sitting behind Antony Levasseur is his wife. He took the help of his wife and another guy called Armand Seguin and measured how much amount of oxygen we now actually respire in a day or an hour that actually gives the amount of energy we now consume in a day or an hour. Are you all with me? The energy that we consume, our oxygen that we now burn out, or the, the, the rate of activity that we show in our body, which is called as metabolic rate, metabolic rate of all of us. People have shown that if you now draw on the x-axis the size of the organisms from rat to pigeon to rabbit to chimpanzee, human being to elephant, there is a perfect relation between the body mass and the total metabolic rate of the organisms. The amount of oxygen we consume per unit time goes on increasing with the body mass in this fashion. It's a linear relation. However, observe carefully one thing. X-axis here is on the log and Y-axis here is also on the log. If you now actually measure the weight of the body and actually measure the metabolic rate without converting them into the log, this is not a linear relation, it is something else. What is that? And that is given by this equation, body metabolic rate is equal to a constant into body weight to the power 3 by 4. What is 3 by 4 value? 0.75 and that follows this curve. In other words, if you plot the body weight on the x-axis without converting to log and the metabolic rate on the y-axis without converting to log, it now follows a curve that actually goes on plateauing. It increases, doesn't plateau, it goes on increasing but not linearly. A linear curve will follow like that but this curve follows this. Now what is the implication of this? There is a great implication of this which actually tells us why elephant eats ba bamboo and rabbits eat grass. Now let me tell you why. I told this equation is given by or this curve is given by the equation bo metabolic body, sorry, what is that? Body metabolic ratio or meta metabolic rate is equal to body weight to the power 0.34 that is body weight to the power 0.75. That is the equation. Remember 
This is the total metabolic rate of the whole organism. What if I calculate what is the metabolic rate for every tissue, or for every gram of tissue, every kg of the tissue, what should I do? This is the total metabolic rate of the organism with the whole of that weight. If I want to calculate what is the metabolic rate per gram of the tissue, what should I do? Divide that by the weight of the organism. Am I correct? Divide by that by the weight of the organism, then I will get what is the metabolic rate per gram of the tissue. And that if you do, that is the equation, divide that by the body weight and you end up with this equation, metabolic rate per unit gram of the body of the organisms is equal to body weight to the power pi minus 0.25. If you plot that, that is the curve you get. Are you all with me? Even if you have got how this curve we got, for a moment believe it because to believe in it has a lot of meaning to it. Let me now expand. So that is the curve we get. What is that? X axis is the body weight, Y axis is amount of the oxygen burnt for every gram of the tissue that we have got. And where is rat, rat standing? Somewhere there. Elephant, somewhere here. So let me ask you the question. Who is burning more per every unit of gram? Yes? Rats or elephants? I want everyone to answer. Rats or elephants? Rats or elephants? Rats. Very good. Rats are burning more of energy for every tissue. So who is more efficient? Elephant or rat? Yes? Elephant? Okay. Obviously elephants are more efficient. Who is burning more per unit of tissue? And so who is more active? Very good. And so who is living faster? Rats. And because living faster, rats die faster also. Why? Imagine a factory, if you put to use every hour 24 into 367 and another factory which uses only once in the morning, once in the evening, which among the two factories last longer? The one which works slower. So elephant works slow because it consumes slow because its energy consumption rate is slow, it can now live longer, whereas rats, because they are very, very, very brisk and active, burn, actively burning the tissue, they die faster. Uh, how much time I have, Sharanya? 15 minutes. I think I will have to skip that, but let me, okay. There is also a reason you can explain why it is so, but I will not go into that because of lack of time. But there are implications. What is that? Now, because the rat is now burning energy more, to give the toxin it has to respire also faster. So, rats will have faster respiration. In other words, small organisms respire slow, large organisms respire, sorry, small organisms respire fast, large organisms respire slow, so we are all very slow compared to rats. And heartbeat accordingly also is very high for rats. If you have ever held a rabbit, you would see its heart. It will be beating faster than your own heart. You have all observed that? If any of you want to see, go and catch hold of a rat or a rabbit or a squirrel. You will see its heart will be beating like, you will start wondering if that it is dying. You also think that, oh, maybe because I've held it, it is afraid and so heart is beating. No, their heart rate is generally very high. So heartbeat is high in rats compared to elephants. And so rabbits die early compared to elephants. And small animals need rapid supply of energy. Why? They are burning so fast. They need rapid supply. And so if a rabbit eats bamboo, the conversion of bamboo to energy is so slow, a rabbit cannot live because it wants fast energy supply. Fast energy supply comes from eating grass or bamboo? Grass. So rabbits eat grass because they want fast energy and they cannot survive eating bamboo. Whereas elephant is a slow guy. Oh, so they eat the bamboo, they digest it slowly, energy release also slow, their heartbeat also slow, their respiration slow, they live also long. You, are all, you all agree with me? Okay. 
Rabbits eat grass, elephants eat bamboo because of this reason. I will skip that. <coughs> Uh, because 15 minutes, I will take another 2-3 minutes here. Because small organisms are very fast and active, they also have to perceive things very fast. Take for example a squirrel and let us say this is a movement of the squirrel. The graph that I have shown here is imagine it is a path of a squirrel. Though it is something else, imagine it is a path of a squirrel. Now imagine another squirrel watching it and let us say that squirrel watches it there there, 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 because they have to perceive, no? So when they perceive and observe there, they integrate their path with those points. So last time it was here, now it is here, now it is here, now it is here. So they integrate their path and they come out with the path of their friend like that. Are you all with me? So looking at where that you know, squirrel was found, they integrate the path like that. Whereas if you now look at an owl, Owl is larger than squirrel. That fellow is slow. It won't perceive as fast as the squirrel. And so what it does, it perceives there, then perceives here. Slow fellow, it perceives somewhere there. And so it integrates very slowly. And the path that is conceived by the owl is this. Compare the two. This is the path conceived by this. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, what happened? Yeah, this is the path conceived by the squirrel and that is the path conceived by the owl. That is because the organisms differ in the way they perceive the senses from the nature. Are you all with me? Okay. So I also wanted to show something about the light perception. Let us not bother because there is no time now. Finally, so far what I told is about the sizes and scales and ratios of organisms within itself. Now let me also explain that sometimes some very peculiar and interesting ratios are also emerging in the course of evolution. I will just finish my talk with one such story of how a very peculiar ratio has emerged in the course of evolution of organisms when they start fighting with each other. The example I would like to now show you is from these nut catchers in Iran. There are two species of nut catchers. One is Sitta Neumeyer, don't bother, simply call it as SN. What is that? SN. And there is another, actually this SN occurs in this area in Iran. The area that I marked here is a place where it occurs. Okay? There is another species, again a nut catcher, whose name is Sitta Tephronota, don't bother, it is ST. The first one is SN and it occurs in this area. Now, let us put the areas occupied by both of them. That is SN and this is ST. As you see, this SN and ST are overlapping in this area. Okay? Now, if you look at this SN and ST, independently in their original areas where they don't overlap, they are so similar to each other, sometimes taxonomists confuse them as to be other species. They are actually almost so similar. However, when you now catch the same organisms in the overlapping area, they are very, very different. Look at the beak of this fellow, very long, and beak of this fellow is very small. Whereas originally, the beak lengths are not very different. Are you all with me? So in the areas where they are overlapping, one among them is large, another is small in the beak length. Whereas in the areas where they are independently occurring, their beak lengths are same. Now why is this? This is because they now come to an agreement with each other. A kind of peaceful agreement unlike what is happening in the yeah, Israel area. What is this peaceful agreement? Let us say this is the kind of insects available in one area and that SN species eats all these insects. The insects marked in that. Okay? In the other area where ST occurs, again there are insects and that, in, that, that bird ST consumes those insects. So both of them are consuming the same types of insects because they are independently separated. In other words, to represent that, let me now say that these are the size of the insects. Now, one among the bird SN eats that range, correct? And 
In another area, again the same range of insects are available, ST consumes that area. You see the two are overlapping. In its area, it is eating some insects which are exactly similar to another area where other bird is eating, right? When you now bring them together, obviously the two ranges are overlapping. What would happen to them? They start fighting. We use the term competing, okay? So they compete for the same resources. So what happens now? So you see that this bird and that bird are eating the same kind of insects. They compete. When this kind of competition emerges, as I told, they enter into an agreement. What is the agreement? This fellow says, okay, I will eat left part of this distribution. That fellow says, okay, I will eat this part of this. You see the amount of overlap now? Reduced. Okay? I wish this kind of cooperation comes among the human societies also. We could have perhaps avoided what is being seen in the Middle East. In other words, to now eat, sorry, to eat these insects, this fellow has to reduce its big size, correct? Whereas to eat those insects, that fellow has to increase its big size. In other words, by character displacement, by having different size of characters, they have agreed to now live with each other, to cooperate, but the question is, how much big should be the bigger beak length compared to the smaller beak length, okay? How much bigger should be that? Earlier they were the same. But now they have separated. How much big this should be? Now this was answered by an ecologist called Hutchinson. Let me cut the whole sh story short. He wrote a paper called Homage to Santa Rosalia. Or why are there so many species? Let me not go into the details, but only give you the reason why he called it as Santa Rosalia. He went to Italy to investigate a particular question of the water bugs. He collected the water bugs from a mountain range where there was a church. Behind that church, there was a cave. In 12th century, one nun had disappeared and no one knew where she has gone. It turned out that in that cave, one skeleton was recovered and they associated that skeleton to Santa Rosalia who disappeared in 12th century based on the dollar that she was wearing. Now, Achinson went to the same cave and got some water bugs and developed a fantastic idea. And so he now credited that idea to Santa Rosalia. And that's why he called it as home is to Santa Rosalia. What is that he did? Skip all that. He found that whenever there are two bugs in the same area, the larger to smaller bug size was something like 1 is to 1.28, 1 is to 1.34, 1 is to 1.09, etc. The average was 1.128 or 1.3. Are you all with me? If the small is 1 millimeter, 1 centimeter, big one was 1.3 centimeters. So that was the ratio that he found on an average. And that is called as Hutchinson ratio. In fact, in the SN nut catchers also, the largest to the smallest is separated by 1 is to 1.3. Now, this ratio, I'm sure, has a lot of implications for our ladies in the kitchen. Why? Let us say we want to know by kitchens for, sorry, sorry, <laughs> knives for the kitchen, not kitchen for the knives. <laughs> Let us say we want to know or a lady wants to buy knives for the kitchen. And I will give two alternatives. One lady picks this kind of two knives and another lady, Veena, picks this kind of knives. Who among them is more smarter? Second one, Vina seems to be more smarter. Why? Having two knives of the same size are overlapping sizes of no use, isn't it? Whereas if you now have two different sizes, it will be put to different uses. Incidentally, people have found that the ratio with which ladies choose smaller to bigger is 1 is to 1.3. Okay? Not only, just when you buy two, even when you buy three, if the smallest is one, next would be 1.3, and the biggest will be 1 is to 1.3. Not only here, in other words, the ratio of the length of the short to the long, if it is 1 is to 1.3, such a lady is a good lady in the kitchen. Otherwise, she is wasting her money. Now, this is not stopping only to the kitchen knives, skillets. The diameter of the cycles 
that are changing from young age to adult to the old age are all separated. The wing, the, the diameter of the strings in the vena also are supposed to be increasing in their size in the diameter by 1 is to 1.3. Thus, the entire nature seems to be controlled by some specific ratios and numbers. Let me conclude that. One, we saw that nature loves certain numbers, that is Fibonacci series. And Fibonacci numbers are associated with the golden ratio, sorry about the mis uh, that spelling there, golden ratio and golden mean. The biological systems are built around these numbers, these ratios and these golden means. Number two, we found that the body size scales almost million times, correct, almost million times if you take the very smallest to the biggest. And physics of their, sorry, physics of their size and surface area governs most of their physiology. I didn't explain that because of lack of time. Small organisms are more active, live longer, perceive faster and die faster. And competing species always evolve ratios of 1 is to 1.3. This competition need not be only among organisms, it could be among the knives and among the skelets also. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for this really great talk, you know, where different systems which don't seem to be connected to each other uh, also have something in common. We have learned that. So now we'll have a question answer session. Please raise your hands. You'll get a mic and uh, you can ask your questions. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Thank you for your uh, this thing. Very, uh, uh, very beautiful lecture. I came uh, a little late. I, <laughs> this thing, I apologize for that. So my question is, you have, uh, we see in papers and all that, you think you currently just rudeyagada just auto attacks. Is it something related to the you said? Not the, as I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So because you said ele elephants live longer because they live very slow. Yeah. But the same thing applies to the youth also because they are very I fast. agree, but I don't think the Hridayagata is related to the nice. size. So, not as I know. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Sir, you said that uh, they measure the tissue energy spent by each tissue. How do you exactly measure that? As I told, you imagine that uh, an individual is... Okay, simply I can put the following. You put yourself into a big chamber where there is oxygen. Okay. You now leave there for one hour. Then come out and see how much of oxygen is consumed. I know your weight. I know the amount of oxygen you have consumed. So I can now... Okay. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. I initially you showed us a bunch of pictures of flowers. Yeah. Right? So there was an anomaly with the flower with four petals. Four so petals, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. <clears throat> there are... Two ways of answering this. May I know your name? Uh, Sharmada. Sharmi, Sharmila. Sharmada. Sharmada, okay. <laughs> Very nice name. Sharmada, there are two ways of answering it. Num three ways rather. Number one, if you count hundreds of lovers, the frequency with which you get four is very, very less, number one. Number two, even in those situations where you get four, there will be a small aborted one which is not actually expressed. Okay? And uh, yeah, there are two ways of explaining it. In other words, four is a very abnormal number. It's not generally seen. Not generally so seen. it either occurs due to the fact that uh, there's another yes. uh, petal which is not yes, seen, yes, or yes. another some other malfunction. Yeah, or they may be a very bad guy like me who doesn't know about Fibonacci <laughs> number. So that may be. So very very rare though. Okay. okay. Yes. Thank you. So this is just to add to okay. what you said, the metabolism rate, okay. uh, the, the breathing, respiration. Uh, usually they say, uh, if you breathe uh, very slowly, ah. you live longer. Achha. And uh, people like uh, the yo yogis or sadhus, yeah. who have, uh, who, we've right. heard about people who have lived for right. 150 years, yes. 120 years. So they attribute that to very slow and yes. controlled uh, respiration. Yeah. I always have one comparison to give here, madam, between myself and Madhusudan. Madhusudan is very calm, cool, 
and my daughter says I'm very very active compared to Madhusudan. She says, you be Madhusudan, you will live longer. <laughs> so, which is true, yeah. <clears throat> Sir, I have a question. Um, yeah. Sir, um, we saw a lot of examples, most intriguing ones, where uh, various things in nature follow the golden ratios and the Pingala series, as yeah. you mentioned. Uh, but I fail to understand why they are following that. Like, is there a particular reason why they follow the particular may sequence? No, may I know your name? Rakshit Maya. Rakshit, in fact, uh, I don't know if you far, followed carefully. This, in fact, is still a challenge. It is not completely resolved. There are only hand-waving explanations like I gave of overlapping being avoided or packaging of the seeds and all that. How is that it actually arrives? is still not very clear. There are a number of people who have tried to model it, but as I know, so far there is no, what I would say, complete answer that is very convincing. And so as I told, for youngsters it's a challenge. Yeah. Because we see that pattern from microorganisms to true. even the uh, true. galaxies as true, you true, should. True, right? true, true, yeah. Thank well, in, I, I'm not referring to in the, uh, in the plants and the animals, okay. how it arises is still a challenge to explain. So and why it arises also is not a okay. well-answered well question. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So I have a two-part question. The first yeah. one is uh, uh, again about the golden ratio. So there is another number. So golden ratio is I think one plus root five by two. And the other one is one minus root five by two. That uh, so does that one also appear? Because they mathematically they both uh, seem to come down from the same okay. equation. So does the other uh, numbers? I think it's actually the first six. time I'm hearing oh. about the second number. Okay. Maybe so. I will explore, and maybe we should explore that. I really don't know about that. Okay. So yeah, there is a difference equation. So the, the, both of them are roots of that quadratic equation. Oh, okay. One okay. is the golden ratio. One plus five. Uh, one plus root five by two. Okay. Second one is 1 minus root 5 by 2. Okay. And as far as I know that the first one seemed to be abundant in yes. nature. Yeah. The second one is, I don't know. Okay. I will check on uh, that. Huh. Second question was, uh, so we saw that elephant uh, uh, was living longer because yeah. its metabolic rate was yeah. slower. And uh, you related it to the size of the organism. But there are also organisms like turtles who live longer that are small. As I told, biological system is very peculiar. Sometimes there are dirty people like turtles. So these are like uh, yeah, exceptions, exceptions that prove the rule. There are some other modifications which cannot fit into this whole thing. Yeah. In fact, uh, people are now trying to also find out those organisms that fall away from the straight line are to be observed very carefully. They are the, not mutants, they are real deviants which have some other strategy of now overcoming the, yeah. So, Thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay. Uh, have people tried uh, making machines in Fibonacci ratio and have... Well, there are. You can go to, not machines. Well, I'm telling uh, kind of, you know, what I would say, designs. Yeah. Uh. As I told, uh, someone has developed a, a series of cardboards connected with the uh, threads. So he simply throws, it goes out like the tail of a monkey and draws, it folds back like our fist. So in fact, there is also a good amount of art that is developed using Fibonacci series. You can in fact Google it and then find out. Beautiful art structures, designs, yeah. So the, uh, doing two things hmm. without uh, applying the Fibonacci ratio, and uh, not applying uh, and uh, applying the Fibonacci ratio, have they observed anything different in the two machines? Very clearly. In fact, as I told you, this folding, the, the, this, this formation of spiral or folding back very griply cannot be attained if you now follow a ratio different from that. It's not very perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Just as an addition to what he said. Okay. Uh, uh, some time back I came across a high school project by a student in the US huh. uh, where he has developed a solar tree. So all the solar panels are in the, in the formation of Fibonacci. Okay, uh, okay. Just okay. like the leaf, ar leaf arrangement. Okay. So here you can actually control the experiment and you can uh, 
measure the voltage uh, that is developed because of the light wow. falling at a particular angle. Uh. And he has found out through the project that Fibonacci arrangement gives the maximum voltage output. Beautiful. So even for photosynthesis purposes, it should be yeah. a very good one. Yeah. 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 Any other questions? Does the Fibonacci series work in animals too? Very much. It, it, you know, in animals too. For instance, Fibonacci ratio, the length of the Fibonacci bones works for the tail folding and the snail folding. So it works. Yeah. I Any more questions? Okay. Okay. So then thank you very much for attending today's talk and uh, so we can end here. We have uh, tea and biscuits outside so please have